This week on Africa Weekly. After the news, we will go to Garissa, the northeastern town in Kenya rocked by last week's massacre of nearly 150 university students by Al-Shabaab militants. Then to South Africa, where rangers have pioneered a new birth control vaccine to keep their elephant populations in check. And finally, we bring you the enduring beats from Ethiopia's famous jazz club, rising from the ashes of a recent fire. But first, a summary of the stories that made the headlines this week. Over a week has passed since 148 people were killed in an Al-Shabaab attack in Garissa. The massacre has been condemned by Muslims and Christians alike, with one community leader calling it violent and evil. Five men have been arrested in connection with the attack. Anger's growing in Somalia after Kenya banned money transfer services to the country. The freeze is part of a crackdown on alleged Shabab supporters. But the move has been dubbed a collective punishment by the many Somalis who depend on money transfers from their families living abroad. A Dutch hostage in Mali has been freed following an operation by French special forces. Stark Rieke had been held by Al-Qaeda's North African arm for more than three years. In Kinshasa, authorities are trying to explain the discovery of a mass grave, as rumours suggest it's the burial site of a number of opposition supporters. And finally, South Africa. Students celebrate the fall of a statue of British colonialist Cecil Rhodes at the University of Cape Town. But there's been a backlash as some white groups protest what they see as a threat to their heritage. In the aftermath of the Al-Qaeda-linked Shabab's attack on Garissa University, town residents and university students recount the attack and call for action from the Kenyan government. The crack of gunfire running in confusion. This is how dawn broke over Garissa University as militants from Somalia's Al-Qaeda-linked Shabab stormed the campus. By the end of an all-day siege, 148 people were dead, mostly students in what was the deadliest terrorist attack in Kenya since the 1998 U.S. Embassy bombing in Nairobi. Helen Titus, a student at Garissa, hid in her dresser at the sound of gunshots before being discovered by a Shabab attacker and brought to a common hall alongside many of her peers. Those and Shabab, they told us the ladies, their Koran does not allow them to kill the ladies. So they took their guns and they started shooting the guys, the men, when the ladies us were able to see what was happening. We were very shocked. Like me, I've never seen anybody who is being killed. But yesterday I saw the men were, were killed in a very in a very a very bad way. The Islamist group has carried out a string of terror attacks on neighboring countries, mostly Kenya and Uganda, in revenge for their participation in the Somalia-based African Union force. In 2013, they targeted the Westgate shopping mall in Nairobi, a four-day siege which left at least 67 people dead. Their warning of a long, gruesome war unless Kenya withdraws its troops from Somalia and are threatening another bloodbath. The day after the Garissa attack, residents of the eastern town marched in the streets calling for action from the Kenyan government and demanding answers as to how critical intelligence warnings were missed. How did these people reach here? How did they come to the university? You know, that's, those are the questions that we are supposed to ask. If they could have done enough, you know, uh, of gathering information, I believe that we could have, uh, this could have not happened here. On Saturday, police in Greece have paraded four corpses of the gunmen on the back of a pickup truck as crowds fought to catch a glimpse of those who had so devastated their community. The 600 traumatized student survivors from the now-closed college have now left Greece, boarding buses for their hometowns. Many say they will never return. In many parts of Africa, poachers are decimating elephant populations. But here in South Africa, rangers are facing a different challenge, overpopulation. Elephant numbers are doubling every 15 years. And with each animal eating 200 kilos of vegetation every day, it's putting pressure on the environment. So they're taking drastic measures firing contraceptives into female elephants from the air. A task that's easier said than done. Everyone thinks, well, an elephant's a really big animal. Yes, it is really big. 
when you're moving the helicopter and this they're running underneath the trees and the helicopter's trying to miss the trees and everything like that it does get a little bit tricky you also want to make sure that you always hit the elephant in a good muscle because for the um the vaccine to be most effective it's got to get uh, absorbed through the, the blood vessels in the muscles Researchers at Makalali Game Reserve in the north of the country are studying the long-term effects of contraception on elephant herds. They've equipped some females with satellite tracking collars, but they have to be changed regularly, which involves anaesthetizing the animals. The collar's been on for four years and it's, it's expired, so we're putting a new satellite collar on, which will enable us to monitor the animal and just track um, to, a, to a better degree, because her movements represent that of a herd. So it's important for the monitoring, specifically from the behavioural side effects, um, and to make sure that everything's going according to plan. Audrey's research so far shows that birth control has not affected social dynamics between animals within herds. In essence, the elephants' home ranges have remained unchanged. Um, their associations have remained um, intact and as strong as ever. Um, and so everything is going according to plan. Thanks to the contraception program, numbers have stabilised in the Makalali Game Reserve at least. It has now been adopted in more than 20 reserves, allowing rangers across the country to control elephant numbers without having to resort to a cull. The once buzzing Jazz Amber Club in Addis Ababa is today a charcoal shell of its former self. A fire burnt down the famous jazz club in January, striking a blow to the local music scene that has been enjoying a renaissance. Local musicians like Misale Legese lost more than just his favourite traditional drum in the inferno. It was total damage. It was there, that's a backstage. It was there also, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, it's a good income for me when I'm playing for in Jazamba because I was, I was playing for like a week, three days, so I got a good money. Um, yeah, it's a big thing. It's a big thing. I lose uh, many things. The Jazz Amber Club was run by musicians for musicians and hosted live music every night of the week. Its owners also ran a music school and the club was an important venue where students could perform in front of a live audience. So it became like a show where all the musicians from all the schools will play for each other and then there's somebody else also coming, uh, a accomplished musician, giving a workshop and everybody will talk and we had close to 300, 400 people really packing the place up. It was a very important movement and then this accident happened. <laughs> Ethio Jazz was born in the late 60s and early 70s and became famous for its distinctive sound. But despite its recently regained popularity, only a couple of live music venues in Addis offer a chance to hear it. Yeah, it's true we lost a very valuable uh, uh, jazz venue uh, situated at a very historical place. But uh, I think the music scene in Addis is much bigger than, bigger than that. Uh, it's not just tied to uh, Jazamba, so I'm, I'm quite optimistic that uh, uh, the music scene will go on and also will uh, do a lot more uh, uh, with other clubs and, and also we're uh, optimistic to uh, rebuild jazz, Jazamba. For musicians and audiences alike, seeing Jazamba rise from the ashes can't come soon enough. <laughs> And now for some offbeat news. Kinshasa's crossroads are being patrolled by giant robots. Though some may find them a bit of a strange sight, these robot cops not only regulate traffic, but they're saving lives too. Next week, we will head to a village in Northern Ivory Coast where gold mining has given locals a new lease on life. And we will take a look at the Ugandan slum Wakaliga at the heart of Uganda's nascent Wakollywood film industry.